Creating your own instruments is incredibly fun, but also incredibly rewarding. You get to hear something that you've created that no one else has. It's truly unique in your track. It can also have practical and economic uses as well. Maybe you can't play a particular instrument. Maybe you don't own that instrument, but you still want to be able to play it later. So sampling is super, super useful. And built into Logic are some pretty powerful samplers, and we want to take a look at those today. Hey, my name is Steve, composer, engineer, and lecturer, and welcome back to the channel. Sampling has a long history, from music concrete in the early 20th century through to the Bronx and hip hop scene, sampling vinyl records and that sort of stuff. Through to now, modern music production, a lot of it is sampling and sample libraries and sample flipping and manipulation. It's in pop music, it's in film scores, it's in pretty much everything. If you've ever used an audio file to make a song or you've ever used a sample library to make a song, you've used sampling in some way. It can help create something new out of something old. It can help you record something you don't have access to as well. You can also make use of MIDI then to play back the sampler, to play things that you never would have been able to play on the original instrument. All that power and that flexibility and those options come from a relatively easy, simple concept. And that is to play back an audio sample when you want it, at the right pitch, at the right time. And that's all samplers are doing. So Logic has two samplers. It's got a quick sampler and the multi sampler, and we're gonna take a look at both. So let's dive in and check them out. So MIDI samplers are actually software instruments. They actually go into our software instrument tracks inside Logic. So I've loaded up a software track here and down here in the inspector under the instrument slot is where I can find my quick sampler. So the quick sampler is the first of the two samplers that I wanna show you today. And if you don't see it up here in your recents, you'll find it down here. You've got quick sampler and then the other sampler we'll take a look at in a bit. You've got the choice of course of mono or stereo. I'm going to choose stereo in case I want to load up a stereo file. The main difference here is if you have a mono audio file that you want to sample, then you can get away with a mono instrument because it's not going to play back anything in stereo. If you have a stereo file though, you are going to need to load the quick sampler stereo version because otherwise you're not going to hear that beautiful stereo image. So inside our tracking, we now have the quick sampler and this is all it is. It's a very simple sampler that has a few quick tools that you'll find on most samplers and basically one spot for something to be sampled. This is where quick sampler and the bigger sampler or multi sampler differ. Quick sampler is literally just for one audio file. So if you have one note that you've sampled or one drum hit or whatever, and you want to play back that, then you can use quick sampler. There's no need for the big sampler. So I have a sample that I've recorded. And I'm just going to drag and drop that one in from my finder and drop it into this space. You could do this from finder or you could do it from a region that's sitting in the track. Either way, when you drag it in, it's gonna load it into the sampler. So here we go, drag and drop, and it's gonna choose two options, original or optimized. You can see that the original says, use original tuning, loudness, looping, length, and all that sort of stuff, whereas optimized is optimized tuning, optimized loudness, optimized loop, and so on. Basically, the difference here is that it tries to read the file and optimize the sampler to it, or just loads the original file and you have to do a few things extra yourself. I'm going to choose optimize because it's just faster and it will try and do things by itself. So that's kind of what I'm after. But if there is anything that goes wrong, I can of course change it myself. So you can see it's dropped it in there and now we can see the waveform, the audio file itself. And it's tried to pick up the start and the end time. So you can see that the, the file that I have, it has a kind of long decay that it kind of goes out to silence, so it's just kind of brought it back a little bit. And same here, it's saying it's starting a little bit too low. So if I want to be really, really precise at the start here, for example, I can scroll in and look for a point to start at. So I could move this bottom part and start somewhere different if I wanted to. So now that it's loaded in the file, basically I can now play something. If I just play a note on my keyboard, I'm going to hear a note. So I actually played the C3 key on my keyboard, but it sounded a little bit like it's an octave too high up. And that's actually because the root key needs to be set. Any kind of audio file, when you load it up, if it's a pitched file, you need to tell the sampler what pitch it's actually playing. Because all the sampler is doing is it's taking that sound and it's stretching it up and down the keys so that you can play high notes and you can play low notes. For instance, if I play a high C, we're getting a much higher sound. If I play a low C on the keyboard, it's stretching that file out and playing a lower pitch. 
They're both the same note, but they're octaves apart. The thing is though, if we wanna make sure that that C that we're playing on the keyboard in our sampler is the same C to all the other instruments that you're playing, you need to tell the sampler what note the file itself is playing, so then it knows how to stretch them up and down the keyboard and to be in tune with the rest of your, your sample libraries, the rest of your instruments that you're playing. So when I sampled this note, I actually put in the root key or the note that this sample is playing into the file name. And this is a pretty common convention for sampling is you put the very last thing, an underscore and the note name. The thing is though, this one's actually picked up and thought that it's C2, not C3. So this is a very quick adjustment. If I just drag this up until I get to C3, now when I play C3, the right note is playing. That's what we're after. Now when I play C4, I'll get that octave up sound. And if I play C2, for example, an octave down, I'm gonna get a lower pitch. And now, of course, we can turn this one audio file, this one note, into a chord. Now, I played the whole chord there and just let it ring out, and you heard that certain notes started to fall off. This is the problem when you're time stretching a sample to make it you know, stretch out to be a lower pitch or compress it to be a higher pitch. That means that the file is gonna run out sooner or later depending on how high or low that pitch is. So a very common workaround is to just loop the audio file. There's a point where you can loop inside the file to make it sound nice. Right now in Quick Sampler, I haven't got any loop set up. So I just kind of come in here and I go, let's do a loop. So I'll go a forward loop. Basically forward re reverse and alternate change the direction of the looping. So forward would be, I'm gonna set up a loop point and it's gonna loop and it's gonna loop back, but it's always gonna be going forwards. Reverse, of course, once it gets through to the end, it actually plays in reverse and then goes back and plays in reverse. Not something I want. Alternate as well, kind of plays forward, then backwards, then forwards, then backwards. Again, something that I don't really want for this one. Right now, I just wanna loop a particular section constantly. So it's much more like cycling in your door. If I turn that one on, it's tried to pick the best spot. Let's actually just play the note and see how it sounds. Not bad, we could finesse it a little bit. There are also some fade-ins that have been applied. And if you drag this one in, you can see a fade-in being adjusted at the beginning at the end. And essentially this is a cross-fade. As we start to enter this zone, we also start to hear audio from this zone looping back. So you get a bit of a merge. So I'm gonna try and just stretch this loop out a little bit and have the cross fade a little bit more. Let's play again. Yeah, I quite like that. That sounds quite nice. And now when we play that same chord, There we have it. We now have notes that are lasting the same amount of time. And basically we'll keep going until I let go. Now you can hear it was kind of oscillating a little bit and that's because that loop point is quite short. That's why sampling a long note and looping a larger section can be quite nice because then you, you don't notice the constant looping, particularly when you get to a very high note. becomes really noticeable that do, do, do. As, the, as the pitch sort of changes, it becomes really, really noticeable. Anyway, that's fine for now. So that's what we've done so far. We've dragged in an audio file. We've come down here and set the root key to be correct. We've set our start and end points, which we can also add fade-ins if we wanted to. And then we've set up a loop. Just at the bottom again, I'm closing this information strip and I've just set up a loop here and that's given us this yellow section. And we've set our loop, set our crossfader, and now we can play chords with a single note, which is awesome. Right now though, as I play a note and let go, it kind of snaps off pretty quickly, but we can change that with an envelope. And an envelope is something that we see in sampling all the time. It's basically the shape of the note. Every note has an envelope. Every note attacks, and that could be a fast attack, like hitting a snare drum, or a soft attack, like blowing into a tuba, for example. As that note attacks to its loudest, it dies away a little bit. And that's called the decay. So it dies away a little bit. If you think about a snare drum again, when you hit it, there's a loud sound and then it dies away. And then there's the sustain section. And that might be if you're playing a wind instrument or you're playing a, a synth 
or you're playing anything that doesn't just kind of hit and ring out, you can sustain that indefinitely as long as you're holding down the note or as long as you're blowing air into the instrument, as long as your lungs last, I guess. So that would be the sustain volume. And that might not be the full volume that it uh, that the attack hits to. It's probably lower. And then there's the release. As it dies away, as you let go of the sound, then it dies away. And you think about that with a snare drum, you can hear it trailing away as the snare drum kind of the skin rests and the snares rest underneath it. As you stop blowing air through a French horn, for example, the note doesn't just stop, cut off immediately. It kind of dies away quickly, but you know, there's a little bit of air just still traveling through and that just kind of drops away. Or you may intentionally do it. You'll slowly release and stop the air rather than stopping it abruptly. So when we look at our instrument here, that's when we can look at these filters. And the one that I've been talking about is the volume or the amp section. So this amp basically gives you a few little controls, like you can pan left and right, you can up and down the volume. And this polyphony over here is how many notes you can play at once. So 16 is quite good because I've only got 10 fingers. Uh, but if I had the sustain pedal on and I was adding note after note after note, I might need to up that. Down here though, that's where our envelope is. So let's say we don't want this harsh attack. Right now, the sample itself has a slow attack, but if I just move this in, you'll sort of see what I mean. It kind of starts quite abruptly. We could then delay that by dragging this little attack dot, either the dot on the screen here or this zero section here, we could increase this. So let's say take it to 435 milliseconds. Let's make it even more dramatic so we can really hear it. You can really hear the note kind of slowly crescendoing up, kind of fading in rather than just immediately starting. If we do some more shaping, let's bring this back. I'm going to make a more dramatic shift. I'm going to bring the sustain volume down. This measure in percentage rather than time because it's sort of how much of full volume do you want to be sustained? If I drag this decay out as well, so it takes a little bit of time to come down to that, I could do something a little bit like this. Now when I play the note, it's almost like sports sandal or something where it's like bum, dum. It's kind of hitting hard and then immediately ducking away. So we can use this envelope to shape the note as much as we like. And that gives maybe a little bit of texture to our chords. Something a little bit different, and we can really shape it beyond what originally the sample sounded like. So we don't just have to sample it and play it back faithfully, we can start to manipulate it a little bit. There are other cool controls in here, and another typical one would be the filter. The filter helps kind of cut out frequencies. We've set it at a low pass at the moment, which means that low frequencies are getting through, but high frequencies are not. So if I play a note, let's just increase that sustain again so we can hear full volume. I'm going to play a note and slowly roll down this filter. So you can really hear that there, there's those high frequencies being cut out of the sound. And that's a classic synth kind of technique, but it also can be used in sampling as well, which is quite nice. You've got things like pitch, glide, fine tuning, coarse tuning, all these things. I won't go into too much detail. Experiment, try them out. They're all fairly common to synthesis, and this is where synthesis and sampling overlap quite a bit. It's kind of cool, if you're into one, you can kind of bridge the gap and go into the other because things like filters, things like envelopes, things like tuning, they're all the same. It's just in synthesis, what starts and creates the sound is different, whereas we're starting with an audio source and a sample. Okay, I'm gonna do something a little bit different now. What I'm gonna do is I've opened up Logic's looping here just to access some some random loops and I can throw these into the sampler as well. All these are actually royalty free, so you can do this at any time. Let me open up an instrument and I'm gonna sort through drum kits. Let's grab something from here. Sounds good. I'm just gonna drag and drop that in as well. I'm gonna just do optimized again. And here we go, it's dragged in the loop. Now what we can do with this loop is really, really cool. For a start, let me just turn off the loop. I'm just going to turn that to no and I'm going to isolate this first sound here and I'm going to bring this back and I'm just going to fade out the sound. And now we have one sound and if I play C3, 
it's my kick. I've isolated the kick. A little bit of a ring of some symbols there, but I've, I've isolated the kick there. If I want to take the ring out, for example, maybe I could use the filter. Let's turn the filter on. Let's roll off some of the high frequencies. Nice, sounding good now. We've kind of taken away that high sizzle of some symbols. High sizzle of some symbols. Say that five times fast. That is high, high sizzle of some symbols. Anyway, now that I've got that kick though, I've been playing C3 because the root note is set to C3. If I just hide this menu bar for a moment, there is C3. At the moment though, key tracking is on. And if I keep pressing different keys, I get different pitch tunings as I move around different keys. Now for a drum sound that doesn't really make much sense. Maybe you do want to grab a kick and you know make it even subbier and lower by pitching it down an octave, but we don't really want to turn this into toms. It's not like I'm playing a tom part. I just want the kick drum to be consistent throughout the whole track, no matter what key I press. So I'm just going to turn off key tracking and then no matter what one I press, it's always the same sample, always playing back at the same pitch. Now at the moment we've been using Classic and what Classic does is it follows the envelope and closes out the release curve. So if I tap the note really quickly and you can see the playhead going past, it does reach the end, but if I stretch this out, you can see it dies off before the end of the sample. What one shot does is it will play through the whole thing. I can still do a fade out if I like, but it will play through the whole sample. So if I just tap the key again very quickly, you can see it reached all the way to the end no matter how fast I tapped that key. So this is quite good for drums because drums you kind of want them to ring out to the end. You don't want them cutting out halfway through. So you might just go one shot so that no matter how fast or how long you press that key, it's going to play the whole sample. So let's bring that back to here, isolating our kick and lovely. Great kick sound. Now the other one that we've got up here is slicing and I've actually dragged in a drum loop and this is where it can get really cool. So I'm just going to stretch this back out. Again, we've got the full drum loop here. It's not being looped or anything, um, but if I played the one shot now, it will play the whole drum loop for us. Let's have a listen to the drum loop. That's the drum loop in its entirety. What slice will do is it will look for transients, which are the loudest parts of each of the signals and try and put them on a separate key. So let's take a look. If I grab this into slice mode, you can see there every hit it can find, every transient, it has pulled it out and it's assigned it to a different key. So it's starting on C1 here, we've got our kick, which is quite nice. I'm gonna roll this back up so we can hear the full frequencies of what's happening on this filter. So that's that kick. If I press C sharp one now, there's my snare drum, D1, Sort of the end of the snares, I kind of don't really need that one, but it's there anyway. D sharp one. Hi-hat. Between those three keys, I've got a drum kit sound. Not bad. Straight away, drum kit. So you can turn any drum kit loop into a drum kit machine, if you want, just using slices. So you can't really change what note each one of these, of these is set to, but you can change the start key. So if C1 is too low down for you, you can adjust that up or you can adjust it down. C1 is typically where the kick starts. So most of the time C1 is a pretty good spot and it will match up with your pad controls and that sort of thing. But if you do need to adjust that up, let's go up by an octave, for example, then uh, just starting on C3. Well, that's two octaves. Starting on C3 there rather than C1. Really, really cool, really, really easy, and quite powerful. Quick Sampler is basically making any kind of single audio sample something far more than it is alone being played in the door by itself. A lot of people love taking drum loops, for example, and chopping up the audio and laying it out on the track. That's fun, that's kind of an old school way of doing it, you know, in the days that you didn't have things like these samplers available, but now you can just throw that drum loop into Quick Sampler, pop it into Slice, and use MIDI keys to play the drum kit sound much faster than just chopping up the audio and uh, copying it if you need a new session. Use MIDI, it's much faster. And of course, turning any kind of single pitched note into lush chords, morphing the sound, a really, really cool thing that you can do with samplers. And it's just using Logic's quick sampler. This is the easy one. This is the simple one. How powerful is that? Okay. Now it's time to talk about the older sibling to the quick sampler, and that's just called sampler, or in brackets, multi-sampler. I've created a new track, I'm just gonna jump into instruments again, and you'll find this one as well in the instruments section, 
but it's just called sampler and in brackets here, multi-sample. That's the main difference between quick sampler and multi-sampler is that if you want to map specific samples to specific keys and you have more than one sample, you're going to need a multi-sampler to play that back. Other popular multi-samplers would be Contact or Ableton Sampler, Decent Sampler, Sforzando. There's lots of samplers out there and Logic Sampler is a really capable one as well. So when I open it up, this is the view that we are greeted with. And this, you know, initially it seems much more scary than the quick sampler. And you know what, it, it definitely can do more things. But when you look here, there are actually some pretty similar things. We've got a filter, which we saw before. We have an amp with volume and pan. We have our pitch controls, fine tuning and specific tuning. We have some envelopes down here as well that can control the amplitude, that we control the filter, whatever we want. It's just getting a little more complex, a little more things that you can do with it. Now you might be looking at this, this screen just by itself and going, well, where does my sample go? There's no region for my samples. If we take a look at the top here, the mapping editor and the zone, these are gonna be quite important. So let's jump into the mapping editor to begin with. What it's done is opened up the mapping area at the bottom and this actually you can scroll through and see the original three parts and you can turn on and off certain sections if you like. So I can turn off the mapping and not see it or turn it back on again. Just makes navigation a little bit easier I think. Now this mapping zone it's not just one big space for the sample to be dropped into. We actually have a much more comprehensive way of sampling because we're not just going to be sampling across the whole keyboard with one sample. No, we're gonna be sampling and attaching samples to specific keys or ranges of keys and specific velocities. This is the essence of sample libraries. They are specific samples attached to specific keys and specific velocities. I said the word specific a lot of times there, <laughs> but basically what I'm talking about is you take an audio sample and it's mapped to a particular location. So if I bring up Finder again, all these different uh, string sounds that I created, this, these are actually the samples that I used to build my Ambido library, which you can download for free at Pianobook if you're interested. But these are all the C notes and then all the E notes that I used and then all the G sharp notes. I sampled in major thirds. So every C, E, and G sharp, and then the next major third above would be the next C up. It gives me three notes per octave. I think that's quite comprehensive. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the G sharp note, for example, but it's also gonna play the A above that, and it's gonna play the G below that, and so on. So it's gonna stretch a little bit. It's not just gonna play one note. Let me just use the C ones, for example. I'm just gonna grab these, and I'm gonna drag these in. So as I drag in, I get a similar sort of thing. I get this option of how I want to choose. I can go chromatic, and as you say there, it's, it's mapping the keys chromatically from C2. Or again, I can, we can try and use optimized. It can try and read the file name, try and hear the pitches, and, and try and tune it to the, the particular space. So the thing is, I've never really found the optimized to be that useful. It doesn't really work that well. So I'm just going to come over here, and I'm just going to use the chromatic section, and then I'm going to adjust it myself. That way I know exactly what I'm doing. I got zone per file or split at silence. I'm going to choose zone per file because each one of these files that I got here, each of these eight files just has one note. And a zone, I'm going to explain that in a moment. So I'm just going to drop those there and let them import. And it's popped it there. I can now see eight individual zones. What a zone is, is one of these little blocks that we can see here. And inside the zone is a file. So our zone editor has now been turned on and we can see the file. And this looks quite familiar from our quick sampling. What it's done though is it's just placed it on every note. So these are definitely on the wrong note at the moment. If I play C1, for example, not doing too bad, that's probably C1. But if I play this D sharp here, that's the C above. And if I play the D here, the C above that. So you can see that they're clearly not uh, the right key at the moment. So we need to do a bit of moving around. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit here so I can see my whole keyboard. And I'm just going to drag and drop these zones to where they're supposed to go. I'm going to click on it here and I'm going to see what the file is named. You can see that here, you can see it down here as well. And I've conveniently labeled everything, as I said, with the convention of underscore and the note name at the end. So C7. So I can easily drag that one and drop it on C7 and leave that there. I have to make sure as I'm dragging around, if you move up and down too much, it might leave not the whole thing covered. So if that happens, you can just stretch it up. Let's do that for all of them. All right, and there we go. I've spaced them all out and they're all on their respective Cs. When I click on each region, I can check that the root key matches the zone because we have to tell the sampler 
that what this file's note actually is as the root key so it can pitch it up and down correctly. So as I go through, I can actually see that it's done that fine. As I've dragged the zone, it's brought the new key that I'm dropping it onto and made that the root key. So that's made it very easy to use. Now I wanna be able to play the notes in between because right now, all I can do is play our C. If I play this C2 here, for example, great, I get a note. But if I play the D above it, nothing because there's no zone attached to that key. So I can actually drag these like this to fill the gap. And if I wanna do a few at a time, I'll just highlight all of them and drag them all at the same time. Now there's some debate as to whether you pitch up or pitch down. It's really up to you and what you think sounds good. A lot of advice is pitch down. So take those higher Cs and drag them down over the keys that are below it and you'll get a nicer sound because there's less information in the audio file when you drag it and stretch it. But realistically, trust your ears. It's always about that. It's always gonna be the answer. It's relative to what you think and what you can hear it sounding like. Now I've just done this conveniently by stretching up because it's easy to show, but I might experiment a little bit with that and see which one works best. Now though that I've filled all of these keys, I can play a chord again, that same C chord. but it sounds so much more full because it's playing multiple samples. It's not playing one sample that's been stretched up and stretched down like before with the quick sample. It's actually playing multiple audio files that are more detailed because they're not being stretched as far to make this wide chord work. That's the benefit of multiple samples is that if you've got, if you've sampled the instrument across multiple notes rather than just one note and stretching it across the whole thing, it's more realistic. The further you stretch or compress audio to make it high, you know, lower or higher pitch, that is going to make it more unrealistic. That's why things sound good, maybe, you know, pitch down a, a, a second or a third or a fifth. But when you start getting to the octave or two octaves, that starts to sound a little unrealistic, particularly when you're pushing it towards the top because there's so much information being compressed into such a short space to make that pitch work. And it just doesn't, well, oh, sounds horrible sometimes. This sounds quite nice though. I'm quite happy with how this one's turned out so far. Now the note was cutting off before when I let go. So I'm gonna scroll up and I'm gonna adjust my envelope which is attached to my amplifier. So this envelope here is attached to my amp, which is perfect. So I'm gonna drag this release time out. Lovely. So now when I play the chord and I release it, I get a little bit of a hangover. Doesn't stop so abruptly now, which is nice. And in here, in each one of these zones, I can also turn on loops. So I'll start at this bottom one and I'll pop in a forward loop and let's just drag that loop to somewhere good. And I'm just gonna do that on all of them now. I'm not gonna worry too much about where exactly they are. I'm just gonna kind of get some happening, but you would want to finesse it to make sure that it sounds quite good for you know the, the file that it's doing. Okay, there we go. We have all of our loops set up on each one of these regions so that now when I hold a chord, it will loop the entire thing, which is perfect. I might just stretch out this release time a little bit further up to about the second or just over just to give it a little bit nicer sort of sound as well. And there we have it, lovely sound. So a really gorgeous sound just created through a few samples, samples that I've taken from a synthesizer. And you know, if I had that synthesizer, which in this case I do, I could go to that synthesizer, but now I could share those samples with someone that I'm working on this project with and they can compose using my synth that's sitting here, but they can actually do it at home. That's one of the flexibilities of sampling. Or maybe you've got something and you wanna sell it, but you do wanna kinda of keep reusing it, maybe capture some samples from it first. You do wanna be careful with sampling. You don't wanna sample something that's someone else's audio, but as long as it's a synthesizer or an acoustic instrument or an acoustic source of some kind and you're creating the audio file, you're not just copying someone else's audio file, you'll probably be okay. Now let's talk about velocity because right now we've spoken about how these zones can be mapped over specific keys. That's what's going on on this X axis here. But if you have a look at this Y axis, there is something attached here, which is velocity. So right now, each one of these keys, the whole sample's being played from the softest hit to the loudest hit. But if I grab these and let's reduce them all, I'm bringing the velocity down to sort of zero to 80 now. If I play a soft chord, 
we can hear those notes playing out. But if I play that chord loud, I, I, I kind of really hammer the key, nothing happens. And that's because I'm using a velocity that's striking up here where there isn't a zone currently. Nothing's in there. Let's fix that. Let's grab some more samples and pop them in above. So going back to my finder, I've got this other sample set above here with a few Cs. I'm just gonna grab C3 and C4 for now, but this is a little bit of a more aggressive string synth, a different string synth that I sampled. I'm gonna drag these in. Now these are C3 and C4, so I might drag these above the C3 and C4 regions, and you can see that Logic's being super helpful. It's just kind of snapping them to the different spots, which is great. So I'm just gonna drag and drop them here, and most of my work's done for me. So this is the C3 sample there, root note C3, perfect. I'm just gonna pop in a loop there so that it loops all up. Add in the crossfade, and let's double check this one. Yep, C4, C4, brilliant. Let's pop in a loop on there as well. So now effectively what I've got is a different type of string synth above on the louder ones. So if I play the soft note again, I get the soft chord, but if I play a loud chord now, I get a different type of sound. And this is really what velocity layers are for. It's so that you can replicate how the sound changes as you play louder. Think about an acoustic instrument, for example. You pluck a guitar string, it sounds mellow and calm. You really pluck that guitar string, it sounds bright and harsh. So you can record two samples, map one to the top end, the loudest, and one to the bottom end, the softest, and that way you've got a little bit more realism added in. There, I've dragged them all in now, so now I can play whatever I like, and I can have a combination of soft notes and loud notes in different parts. It's all entirely up to me on what I wanna play, and it's really, really cool because it's something I've created, it's something that's unique. These were two different synth patches that I created on two different synthesizers, and I wouldn't have been able to play both of them like this if it wasn't for sampling. Now, there's a few extra little fun bits that I wanna kinda of point out. Of course, we've got our same filter, we've got things like pitch bend, we've got all that sort of stuff that we can do. We've even got drive, which I didn't mention before on the quick sampler, so if you want it to be extra gritty, you can turn that up as well. But what's cool about the multi sampler is it's got this mod matrix. It's similar to the quick sampler, and I didn't really point this out before in the quick sampler, but you can use some modifiers like LFOs or envelopes to change a parameter over time. For example, at the moment envelope 2 is attached to cutoff filter 1, so let's, let's add Cut off filter one down, so it's now playing softly. A low sort of bass sound. And let's go down to this envelope and let's do a bit of a shape here. So I want it to kind of swell to brightness, decay away a little bit quite quickly, but then sustain at a point sort of halfway before it releases down to the point where it cuts off. Let's have a listen to that. Nothing happened there, and the reason for it is I haven't yet told it how much of this filter cutoff I want it to affect. So I'm just gonna whack that up to 100. You can see there it's now saying this is gonna be the range. And I could control it. If I didn't want to filter to open up all the way, I could bring that back a little bit. It's quite nice. But I'm just gonna whack that up to 100, and let's have a listen. So you can hear that envelope controlling that shape there. Let's add another one, something entirely different. Let's add velocity. And let's attach that to my filter one cutoff. So I'm gonna bring the cutoff filter back down. I'm gonna affect this a little bit so that then the louder velocities will open up the sound more, whereas quieter velocities, lower notes, will provide a lower frequency. So I'm actually gonna bring this further down so we can really hear what this is doing. So I'm gonna hit a really low velocity. It's both quiet and low down, so we're not hearing those bright frequencies. Now I'm gonna play it a little bit louder. Now we're triggering the new sample, which is much more aggressive, and the filter, the cutoff is opening all the way up. So you can really use this mod matrix in a really cool way to kind of really sculpt the sound and kind of push the sound beyond what it could originally do. That's the beauty of sampling is it's not just about faithful recreations. It could be about mangling the hell out of it and making something entirely new. And you can do that with both quick sampler and sampler in Logic, you've got the tools. If you've got Logic, you've got it already. You just have to go record something, throw it in, 
and mangle it into something your own. So there we are, that's a look at the two different samplers. We've just scratched the surface, honestly, of what they can do. There's a lot more, particularly to the multi-sampler that you can do in the background. And if you're interested about finding out more, why not subscribe? I'm sure we'll be going into it soon. Otherwise though, if you've enjoyed this video, a like would be fantastic and I will catch you in the next one.